Hey, everybody, and welcome to the CS Leadership Roundtable. My name is Andrew March, co-founder of the Success Coaching Training Program. We're back for our monthly live leadership roundtable today, discussing finance concepts that every CS leader should understand. This free learning event is brought to you by Success Coaching, the the world leader in customer success professional development training with now more than 6,000 graduates globally. Our training programs are available in a variety of formats, including self-paced online learning, virtual instructor-led boot camps, and our hybrid 12-week coaching program, one of, one of my favorites. Uh, we also offer a growing number of standalone courses, all taught by industry experts, including data-driven decision-making, having difficult conversations, and change management for customer success. We also recently launched a new leadership track. You can find out more about our training programs at successcoaching.co. Ashley's going to drop that link into chat. Now, for those of you that haven't participated in one of these before, this is a live and unscripted discussion where we dig into a single topic relevant to customer success leaders. Regardless of the company that you work for, the scope of your role, or the sizes of the customers your team deals with, we aim to pick topics that are going to be practical and useful to you. We also encourage you to suggest topics and guests for our program. So reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn and drop me a note and let me know what you're interested in if you want to participate or if you know somebody that wants to participate. The schedule for upcoming CS Leadership Roundtable events can be found at successcoaching.co under the events tab. As usual, we'll post a replay of this webinar along with a transcription early next week. Uh, there's a lot of thought leadership out there, along with a lot of theories about how to deliver customer success. This series allows us to focus on practical, real-world advice, best practices, techniques, and shared experiences from those practicing and leading customer success teams on a daily basis. And to do that, we invite three panelists to join me for a roundtable discussion. These are people who are great at their craft, and we ask them to share their experiences and their perspectives. Now, we will be taking questions later on during this webinar, so use that Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen to ask or upvote a question. Also, please keep commentary to the chat window. So without further ado, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves to y'all, talk a bit about who they are and what they do. As usual, in alphabetical order, let's start with Chris. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. So uh, Chris Hicken here. I'm co-founder and CEO of Nuff Said. We're building an AI-powered brain that helps you to focus on the work that matters. And we're starting with the customer success audience first. Um, we team up with, we actually also produce a ton of content for customer success leaders. We team up with folks like Andrew to uh, produce and get those out. So a uh, big fan of uh, Success Hacker. And um, I am based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Awesome. Quick shout out to Chris and the Nuff Said team on the publishing of 2.0, the rise of the strategic CCO that I that I have got right here. As far as my favorite chapters go, by the way, Chris, of course, chapter eight, speak the language of the CFO is quite prudent for this webinar, but I also enjoyed chapter two on avoiding CS becoming the everything department uh, by Rob Do uh, Dollywall, also the topic of an upcoming webcast that I rec recorded with him. And of course, chapter one by you, Chris, on determining if your company values customer success. Uh, our CSL leadership uh, topic from May. So thanks, Chris. Now on to David. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, David Kaplan here. I'm currently Chief Financial Officer of Acalvio Technologies. Um, uh, that is Latin for uh, deception, or at least the Calvio part. And it's a cybersecurity software platform. Essentially, what we do is assume that a hacker is going to get into a network and then we trick them. We direct them to fake assets, fake files. And while they're snooping around there, it gives uh, the customer uh, the time to discover that the bad guy is in the house and uh, corral them. Um, we're doing it on a, a subscription basis. So um, uh, certainly relevant for the discussion today and thinking about software as a service metrics. Um, I have been uh, emerging company CFO for now going on 20 years. Uh, one such stint uh, with Andrew uh, back uh, not too long ago. Delighted to be on the panel today and offer uh, the finance perspective on this uh, broad discussion of how finance and CS interact. 
Thanks, David. Yeah, that was uh, quite the experience that we went through together uh, a few years ago. So you guys are like the you guys are like the the people that that uh, that that uh, uh, set out those those paint bombs for porch pirates that try and steal steal your stuff, right? That's certainly one way to look at it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. La last but not least, Mike Merritt. Hey there. Um, so I'm Mike Merritt. I head up customer success for Planet. Uh, you may not have heard of Planet, but we're an Earth observation data company. We have a fleet of 160 plus satellites orbiting the Earth, taking pictures of pretty much every spot on Earth every day. Um, so our customers are doing some pretty incredible things. So that ranges from agriculture, where they're monitoring large scale crops, the health, trying to detect diseases or irrigation issues or any issues and, and resolve them before they happen to civil. So monitoring illegal activities, illegal mining, uh, environmental impacts. We have the impact organizations. So like Norway, for example, is monitoring uh, tropical deforestation globally. Uh, so lots of really cool use cases, lots of big customers across a wide uh, range of use cases. Awesome. Yeah. How many fingers am I holding up now? Are you guys that good? No. <laughs> we are, but I can't disclose it. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, thanks to you all for making time for us today. Now let's get to the topic at hand. Finance tends to be an area that most CS leaders feel they need to improve or learn more about. Why is it important? Well, when you're making an ask for something like budget for new headcount or systems to support your burgeoning CS team, it's important for CS leaders to understand the economics of their team and how that plays a role in the broader overall company's economics. Understanding and communicating using the language and perspective of the finance team is just as important as understanding the language and perspective of our customers in order to communicate effectively and frame the value that has or will be created. So to get things started, in your opinion, what are the top three finance concepts that every leader needs to understand? So why don't I uh, go jump in and take this one, Andrew, and then we can uh, kick off the discussion. Um, awesome. It, it's, uh, it's an interesting question from the standpoint that um, for those of you uh, attending this uh, webinar, uh, that work for SaaS companies. I'm, you know, I'm sure you've heard of uh, many, many different metrics over the course of company meetings and the like. Um, so, uh, to be true to Andrew's question, I'm going to focus on three that I think are relevant, uh, particularly for uh, CS organizations. Um, the first uh, is retention rate. Uh, that's the rate at which you're keeping your customers and they're renewing. Um, sort of the inverse of that is your churn rate, which is uh, how many customers are leaving um, as a percent of your total. Um, that I think is probably, uh, in my view, the most fundamental metric for the CS organization to understand, because generally uh, CS departments, they're in the business of making customers happy. If your customers aren't happy and leaving, then that's a big red flag, uh, regardless of the source of the unhappiness. So retention rate really signals um, customer satisfaction, almost direct one-to-one. -one. So I think off the top of the bat, bat that's uh, kind of my uh, favorite uh, number one choice. Um, the second is, uh, you've heard the terms ARR or MRR, those refer to annual recurring revenue or monthly recurring revenue. ARR is really just 12 times MRR. Um, and it, uh, it is spoken in each organization based on whether they typically have monthly or annual subscriptions. Um, so that's kind of a core top line. You know, what are we collecting uh, from customers as a rule? Um, but there's a corollary uh, to that. And that is how much of your revenue coming from customers is recurring versus one-time professional services. So you might be very happy. It's like, gosh, I've got a million dollar account, but 800,000 of it is some complicated customization up front, and 200,000 is what they're gonna pay uh, year in, year out thereafter. It's not quite as impressive as uh, the whole thing being a million dollars of recurring. So that proportion is 
good to know either aggregate or on an individual basis if you happen to be a CS rep covering a set number of accounts. And then lastly, sort of my number three um, is contribution margin. And what that means is for every dollar of revenue that you collect for a customer, how much does it cost to serve that customer that, that are unavoidable costs. That's the typically referred to as cost of goods sold. And revenue less cost of goods sold is your gross profit, or in the case of an individual customer, your contribution margin from that customer. So as a specific example, if you collect $100 a month from a customer, but your software is hosted at Google Cloud Platform and the per customer price Google Cloud's charging you is $200 a month, then you're actually losing $100 a month even to have the customer on board in the first place. And it's not a good idea to sign them up. That's an extreme example, but it's representative of how uh, fruitful each customer is in contributing to support the expenses of the rest of the organization. So I will stop there. Those are my big three. And uh, Andrew, turn it back over to you and we can uh, kind of compare, contrast, give and take. Okay. Chris, Mike? Well, looks like there might be a question that's relevant here for David, which is how, how, how do you add the transaction cost to, co to COGS? Uh, that's interesting. I mean, there's uh, there are some maybe different ways um, uh, to do that. I think from the CS perspective, awareness of uh, what transaction costs there are, and in, in this case, I'm assuming that transaction costs means what it costs to uh, keep that customer, uh, the lights on, if you will, uh, from the software. So I would just, you know, I like to keep things simple from a CS perspective. I'd look at just, you know, what's important, most important is what are the costs to serve each individual customer that can't be avoided? And then, you know, let the rest of the team kind of chip in as to what other costs are involved in uh, uh, maintaining that customer relationship. So is that, that I, I, I've heard people talking about, you know, we, we hear about cost to acquire, you know, CAC, cost to acquire customers. Uh, I, I'm starting to hear the uh, CRC, cost to retain customers. So that would be kind of the, the CRC bucket. Yeah. And, um, you know, cost to acquire a customer, and we can talk about this, certainly um, my colleagues here on this panel, um, but CAC or customer acquisition costs really is in the sales process. And, you know, how much sales and marketing spend does it require to reel a customer in? And the CS organizations need to be aware of that. But in terms of day-to-day -day, uh, operations of the CS function, that CAC has been incurred before the customer even walks in the door. So it's helpful to know and a broad understanding of how your particular company and business economics work. Um, but it's important, and this is why I believe, you know, you can get drowned in a lot of financial metrics in SaaS companies and then kind of glaze over and be paralyzed about the differences. So CRC, cost of retaining a customer, certainly in my view, more relevant for the CS organization in day-to-day -day ops. For all of those, I, I think the, the really insightful thing is to look at it by customer segment and by product or solution type, because that's that's to me where the, the CS team and finance team can partner together, feedback to sales and say, hey, look, here's who you should be going after actually to begin with, because these customers, this whole chunk of customers in this one segment, just they're not profitable for us. Mm -hmm too hard to retain, too, too much cost to retain and too much cost to service. Well, also that analysis can also, you can also take that to product as well. I mean, yeah. we were talking about in the pre-call, David, that that situation we had previously where, you know, uh, 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 engineering was letting a, a, a problem fester instead of addressing it. And, you know, we were able to show by the, the, F, the level of effort that the services team had to go through to do a bunch of free work to get around this deficiency in the product, uh, uh, that the it didn't make find financially didn't make sense for us to to keep doing it that way. Exactly. Exactly. It. David, uh, just the way that I've always described contribution margin 
to the team in the past was, you know, uh, gross profit is the revenue minus COGS, but contribution margins are the revenue minus the COGS minus the variable costs that scale linear, linearly with the growth of the revenue or the customers. So for example, if there's like a, if the customer success support team, for example, scales linearly with the adoption of new customers, that might be a variable cost that's included in, in contribution margins. Would you describe it that way? Is that an accurate description? Yes, um, and that's a great point. And I actually agree with that. Um, the, uh, the, the one thing that sometimes will get confusing is uh, our COGS and contribution margin or revenue minus cost of goods sold or COGS uh, equals Z. And so okay. is Z a contribution margin or is Z a gross profit margin that's different from contribution margin? And there are a couple ways that um, even investor analysts look at this. Um, uh, I tend to be, uh, you know, wearing the CFO hat. I prefer to be conservative on including as many costs into the cost of goods sold bucket as are relevant. So, uh, just as you have pointed out, um, the cost of a customer success rep or a customer success department, in my view, should go into the calculation of the cost to serve and uh, be uh, subtracted um, to get to contribution margin, just as you described. Because if realistically you cannot um, sell a platform uh, without having some account relationship management going on, then by definition, that customer success rep and team is necessary to support that customer and you cannot avoid those costs. So um, there are, as you point out, there are fixed and variable costs that go into um, the cost to serve. Um, you want to capture the variable costs for sure because um, you know there are a couple of reasons. One is to know, uh, as we discussed earlier, that it's profitable to actually add the customer, that those uh, incremental costs to serve aren't too high. Um, but it's also to know that you can scale. So an example of scaling is if you have a product that initially uh, you have one customer success rep for every 10 accounts, um, but the product's humming along and the next product version release is so great that the level of calls that could come in drops precipitously. And now all of a sudden a customer su success rep can serve 100 accounts. Well, you'll have a great efficiency and that variable cost line for customer success reps and costs will trend up much more slowly than your revenue growth. And that's a great situation to have. The converse obviously is a red flag that there's something going on in the organization that needs to be fixed. But um, that's my long-winded uh, response to say, I absolutely agree with you on that. And I think that the three concepts for me that came to mind were where there can be weakness in the customer success department are, I think the first one is around understanding, a deep understanding of how the business makes money. And that starts with, of course, a good understanding of contribution margins and how the CFO chooses to calculate them. But on top of that, it's also understanding what is a company willing to spend to acquire a new customer? What is a company as a percentage of new business? What is a company willing to spend as a percentage of recurring revenue to retain business, their customers? So a lot of, a lot of uh, VPs of CS, CCOs don't know what the CFO is willing to spend to retain a customer as a percentage of the revenue. Um, what's the cost to build the product? So the product and engineering expenses and, and G&A. And th the reality is it is a zero sum game. So if you're advocating for more budget, you have to convince David you know, the David of your company, that an investment in CS is better than an investment somewhere else. And you have to realize your sales leader is coming in with an argument, you know, feed on the street, you know, more one new sales rep equals X new demos or one new, one new uh, uh, AE is, you know, X million dollars more in revenue. So you have to be able to make a case that's equal to or better than that case when advocating for CS budget. So that's, I think that's why a lot of times we, we fall short in our discussions to try to get more budget for, for CS. Um, 
Second concept, I want to plus one what Mike said around segmentation. Um, really powerful to be able to go to the CFO and talk about uh, where their strengths and weaknesses in the customer base by seg- by product, by customer segment, and especially uh, one of the most powerful ones I've seen is revenue cohorts with uh, special attention to first year renewals. Because what you can do is show over time in different customer segments or product categories, are we onboarding more or less healthy customers? So you can show that trend over time. That will also allow the CFO to forecast what retention rates will look like in this kind of new world where we're selling you know, better, you know, two better customers, uh, better onboarding, et cetera. And then the, the last one is, um, I'm gonna actually go back to something David said early on, um, which is revenue health. So not all revenue is made equal. <clears throat> and David mentioned that sometimes services, when services become too high as a percentage of revenue, it can really impact the company's valuation. So it's important for you and the CFO to be aligned on what percentage that is. You know, Salesforce, I think, can get as high as like 18% before Wall Street starts digging their valuation. So what is the David of your world willing to go up to uh, in terms of services without dinging or hurting the company valuation or market cap? Um, but there are other things too, like you know, uh, discounting. How, how deep are we willing to go on discounting? How should we think about multi-year deals? I think if a CS leader can be proactive about suggesting scenarios to the CFO and make a case why certain thresholds will exist, again, it creates, a sen- I think, a real sense of trust and partnership with, with, your, with your finance leader. And I think ultimately, it's just in terms of framing, you know, your CFO is the, the guardian of the company's financial health which will be the main things that investors look at to, to determine what the company's overall value is. And so understanding how your, your CFO thinks about valuation, market cap, what metrics they're measuring towards top level metrics, uh, 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 beyond, of course, just you know, beyond growth rate and uh, gross profit margins. But the other kind of backup margin, you know, it might be a, they might be focused on CAC or lifetime value or other, they might be working on specific metrics that are useful for you to know about as a, as a success leader so that when you're making a case, you're speaking to the CFO about some metric or an area of the business that they care about this year. So Mike, how do you as a VP of customer success, how do you, how do you figure all this stuff out? Well, it depends a lot on the stage of the company that you're in. I think that's one big thing, right? Early on, you're really trying to get some of these early key KPIs and partnering really with finance and sales to figure those out, right? Because I, I think a lot of them are unknown. But just to kind of riff off of something that Chris was saying is like, there's a pivot point, right? So you start gathering data about your customers, but in terms of staffing customer success, it's primarily, hey, how many people do we need here? Like it's a necessary evil, right? As seen by the CEO, like, hey, look, I know we got to invest in it, but it's, you know, it's, it's cost of doing business. That pivot point, though, where net retention becomes such a critical metric to the overall company and and the valuation, that's that point where you need to flip and start saying to the CFO, how much are we willing to invest as a percentage of our revenue in retaining these, in retaining and growing these customers? Right, that is a big, big thing. So I, I didn't want to skip over that um, piece because I, I think it's really, really important that everybody knows to try and do that as early as possible, you're going to be far better off because as otherwise, yeah, the, the sales team, other teams have more concrete metrics that they'll staff on. Um, but just in terms of figuring this out, like the term partnership with finance is, is key. And that's exactly it. I think a lot of leaders uh, that are maybe a little less experienced might see finances like, look, I got to battle with finance for my budget, right? I got to battle for this. You know, finance is always like not approving things that I need and things like that. Bring it in as a partnership, set up a biweekly meeting with them. And half that meeting is finance talking to you about the, the, the things that are keeping them up at night, educating you on some of the metrics of the business, yeah. And then half of it is you saying, here's the challenges I'm having from a business point of view with my team, with 
with the, the goals that we're trying to hit. And they can help solve a lot of those. Like, and that's the thing, it, you need to solve them together. And so those biweekly meetings establish a really good partnership. And that's when, when, when David and I started working together, it's one of the first things I did. We sat down and had a conversation to help me understand, you know, how, how you know, the gap, gap aside, right? Uh, how, how, are you, how are you looking at the business? What's important to you is the, the, the owner of the purse strings here. Um, you know, and, and how can I, how, how should I be presenting to you um, what's happening in my organization and to get yeah. the, uh, how it, how it fits into the overall plan and to get the things that, that, that or to have the discussion to get the things that I feel we need, you know, what's the best way for me to present that information. So just asking, communicating. I love that establishing a relationship, right? Just like we do with our customers to better understand our customers. We need to do that with all the organizations that we depend on. Remember customer success is a team sport. No, it's, it's, it's that way. And that partnership, once it's formed is really, really powerful for the, for the overall business. Just a reminder, um, uh, questions. You have any questions? Use that Q and a button at the bottom of your screen. Sorry, David, you were, you were going to say, yeah, no problem. Um, I just wanted to uh, echo Mike's uh, points here. Um, it's uh, really interesting because oftentimes people will think in an organization, oh, you know, the CF no, CFO knows everything or at least knows everything about, you know, dollar flows in and out of the company. Um, that's not necessarily the case. And you might get a uh, response or a bias from a CFO that's reacting because they don't actually fully understand. And so they fall back on, you know, the linear thinking that a lot of uh, finance people are trained to be, which is bottom line, black and white, and not shades of gray. And this whole partnership relationship that um, Mike is espousing is so important because what you're doing inside the organization is getting the CFO to really understand um, what's going on in the field with the business and in that particular area. So there's context to requests. And especially when you do get to that pivot point that it's really time to put uh, the foot to the gas pedal on loading up, uh, investing in CS reps and in CS resources of of different time, types, um, it's a much easier sell if you've had that partnership relationship uh, put into place because there's context and it's much easier for the CFO to say, okay, if it is a zero sum game uh, and we've got to trade off buckets, this is really a worthwhile investment and here's why. If I, if I take kind of the extreme version of what Mike and David just said, <clears throat> and it's going to sound a little bit jaded, but I think it'll help drive home the point. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> Come for me. <laughs> uh, it's the CFO doesn't care about you, you and customer success. They don't care that you've got overloaded CSMs. They don't care that people are working an extra couple hours at night. They care about their metrics, that they have to, they ha- they have to uh, create a financially healthy company. And so if you want the CFO to give you what you want, you have to make a case in the language that they speak, which is, well, you have to ask, you have to ask them, but what, right. what does the CFO care about and speak in the language that matters to them? Because the, the things that we use today, the anecdotes, the stories, overloaded CSMs, too many customers, reactive mode, they don't care about any of that stuff, right? What they care about is, have we improved our gross profit margins? Have we increased our retention rates? Have, are we growing the business more quickly? Is the business financially sound? It's, it's the with them, right? It's the what's in it for me. It's just, once again, the same concept when we're dealing with our customers, mm-hmm. right? Understanding their perspective, speaking their language. That's why it's so important to, under, you know, to sit down with your CFO and understand their perspective, understand what's important to them, understand how they calculate this particular metric. Don't assume, right? Ask the questions. Um, and, and it's going to be different uh, depending on what stage you're in, right? Early stage, you're you're doing unnatural things to acquire customers and logos and all that sort of stuff. Later stage, things get we pull up our our big person pants and and need to act like a, mm-hmm. a more respond you know as fiscally responsible as, as of an organization as possible. 
Um, we got a couple of uh, got a couple of questions um, popping in, so let's let's uh, start answering those. Uh, so uh, Retta asks, "Do you see revenue reporting as a responsibility of the CSM organization?" Well, I would say no, um, <laughs> but uh, Retta's question is um, good because there are nuances to that answer. Um, there, the CSM organization should have um, backup and support from the finance organization to handle revenue reporting, and that can be through, you know, billing systems, the finance team invoicing, uh, what and tracking, all of that stuff. Um, you know, the CSM typically has their hands full, you know, answering. Uh, a customer and troubleshooting a specific technical or operational issue. Um, that being said, I think it's appropriate that uh, CSM knows what a customer's value is. Uh, you know, if they're paying more or less than somebody else, um, because that uh, gives the opportunity for a CSM to know, well, maybe um, I should. Uh, uh, pursue this a little harder than a canned answer or what have you. So uh, it's a very relevant question, um, but I you know, feel that uh, the CSM can tend to be overburdened with things um, and you, you, as an organization, you want to uh, prevent that. I, I want to chime in a little bit on that too. I, I think, agree with you, not CSM's responsibility to report on revenue, but driving revenue and potentially forecasting revenue are definitely fall into the, to the CS camp. So partnering with finance on forecasts, obviously they're not gonna do it alone, but informing them on, on particularly the, the bigger customers. But I think knowing the, the triggers of revenue, like what are the levers that actually impact revenue in every, any given month or quarter? And what are the actions that a CSM and a customer need to take in order to recognize that revenue? That is critical. Um, so we, we do, for our, our biggest customers, we do handoffs with finance actually and CS where we put together a plan just because a CSM may not know. It gets complicated sometimes and it's really important to understand that. And that's also a good leverage point in the company, right? If you understand like revenue, you're driving revenue, you're helping forecast it, that, that puts the customer success position uh, in, in a stronger position, I should say. So customer success should own a number regardless of reporting should customer oh. success own a number own a revenue forecast number sure o yeah. own own a yes yeah actually own that forget about the re reporting is a you know reporting it is one thing but actually own that number yeah I, i'm gonna i know andrew you're gonna disagree with both mike and i on this point so i think this will be a good discussion topic but i would agree that cs <clears throat> in orgs where cs owns a retention number those we we talk to so many CCOs and VPs of success. When this when the head CS person owns a number, they have way more power in the organization than if they don't. So I, I'm not saying that you can't set up an org where CS doesn't own a number, but when they do, you will wield way more power. Practically for this conversation with the CFO, what happens if you don't own a revenue number? Well, you go into your discussion with David and you say, Hey David, I want more more revenue this year or more, more budget, Michael said, David will say, great, what, what do I get for that? And as a CS leader, you'll say, well, we'll drive up the NPS score by three points, or we'll increase, we'll, we'll decrease customer onboarding time by 30 days, or we will, uh, you know, time to value, or um, we'll have more customers that are in a green health score. And the, David will say like, I don't care about any of those numbers. <laughs> those aren't any of the numbers I care about. So I'm gonna, give the, I'm gonna go give the budget to an executive who will drive the numbers that I care about. So for that reason, I, I'm not saying you have to do this, but I would certainly advocate for CS uh, owning a number for the company, like owning a number that other executives care about. Actually, Chris, I 100% agree with you. Okay. All right. I, used to, I, it yeah. used to be, I used to not be that way years ago. I'm like, why do I need, I need to worry about this. <laughs> right? Right. But, but yeah, I 100% I agree with you. And, and basically for that same reason, I want to I wanna own a number. Yep. Yeah. You should want to own a number. Mm -hmm. 
And that, that ties into the, the next question about CSM ROI, actually. I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, Alejandro, it's kind of, a, kind of a comment as well as a question. Um, in our case, when we were asked about CSM's ROI, all we can say is it could have been worse without CSMs, right? So how, how do we, you know, what, what, are some, what are some ways in which we can demonstrate that ROI? How do we communicate that, that ROI effectively to finance? This is a tough one, but I would say if you can tie health scores to uh, net retention impact specifically, that's one way of doing it, right? And so you can, because that you can vary, you can vary the CSM investment on different accounts and and show the impact on health scores, which directly impacts uh, net retention. The tricky one is the AB test, which we inadvertently did uh, because there was a whole segment of customers that didn't have CSMs. And we added a CSM to that pool and you saw the immediate impact and you saw it then globally as we added across regions. And that was highly effective. The challenge is you need to be at scale big enough where you're okay letting some customers not have a CSM. And that's, that's not something you can do in every company. I think it's the same same thing you need to be able to do when you're making an investment. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody thinks uh, they're, that uh, I am going to bring in a, a, a tool uh, and it's going to be a silver bullet. Well, you better be prepared to explain how that tool is going to change things yeah. for your team, for your customers. If I walked up to you, David, and said, hey, I want to implement Gainsight. It's going to cost us 100 grand. You're going to be like, well, okay, what are we getting for that 100 grand? Right. It's got to be more than just, oh, a place for us to leave notes and, and to warn us when, when uh, you know, customers are going red. Right? Well, how do I translate that into, uh, in, into additional revenue, uh, uh, reduced cost, you know, uh, improved customer retention? Right? What, what, am I, what, what are some of the other triggers that you know, it's going to, uh, for, for you, David, if, if I said additional revenue, reduced cost, um, uh, maybe even, uh, you know, we're going to be able to, uh, do more, more efficiency, be able to, uh, each, each CSM is going to be able to handle more customers, going to increase their, their book of business by 10%. You know, what are the other things that are, you're going to be looking for in, in that type of ask? Yeah. I mean, I think those are, um, you know, I, a number of common sense, uh, metrics to, present. Um, but one of the other things that I will be looking for is, okay, what are uh, the limitations and strengths of the status quo that we're measuring, you know, this new tool that we want to spend coming in? So as an example, um, if there have been a flurry of customer cancellations, why is that? Uh, and is it because we've got a product deficiency or is it because the customer actually that, that the product is fine, but the customer just needed more attention because they weren't taking full advantage of all the features of the platform. And the reason they weren't taking full advantage is that our CS organization is stretched too thin and you know, CS rep uh, A has got to cover 20 accounts and it's just too much. So uh, to me, there's always a context um, in making those kind of decisions because it's easy to say, okay, yeah, here's a 100K uh, subscription to a new cool tech tool that'll allow me to automate and see cool things that pop up on my screen on customers. But if we've got a product efficiency, none of that's going to matter. Uh, if we do have a reach issue, then it's probably a great investment uh, right. because it's solving that. So context really matters a lot. Context matters. Okay. Um, let's see. You got another another question from uh, Suvik. Uh, thanks, Suvik. Chris mentioned valuation and discounting cash flows. Is this something the CS leaders absolutely need to understand when working with the finance department? David, what do you think? Well, I would say at first hand, no. And it gets back to my own personal philosophy that I don't want an organization, individuals and organization have to worry about too much. 
Um, so that's kind of the on the one hand answer. On the other hand, and you know, Chris, you might speak to this um, as a CEO, um, and because it's out there as one of the other questions. Um, different organizations have different philosophies about how much they want to share with the entire team. Um, and I've worked for organizations where the CEO actually absolutely values transparency and wants to use um, all hands regular check-in meetings as an educational tool to actually have folks um, learn about uh, some things that are not necessarily in their functional area in an effort to have a holistic understanding of the business. There are other CEOs who are like, well, I don't want to have to uh, you know, teach a finance course when it may be of limited interest to certain folks. Um, and so it can turn into a boring, long-winded uh, all hands. So you know, there are a range of extremes there. And I think that kind of in that spectrum, are questions like these about, you know, how much does a CS rep need to know about discounted cash flow? Well, I would say superficially, probably not important um, because that person should have support in the organization where that metric matters. But on the other hand, there may be certain situations where uh, it's useful in understanding the broader business, and maybe that will pay off in the way a CS rep thinks about uh, their job. Okay. Uh, I like that perspective from the CFO, David. Chris, what is, what is your perspective as a CEO? Well, yeah, what I would say is um, here's a case where I think it actually would be valuable to understand how the CFO thinks about valuations. When, when you're making a case to the CFO to get more budget, usually we start with the basics, which is we're going to agree that we're going to hire one CSM per $2 million in revenue that the company acquires. Now, unfortunately, that's not a very, very good metric because ultimately what ends up happening in that case is the CFO does what David just said, which is he puts customer success as uh, a cog. So it's, it's a cost line item. It has nothing to do with growing the company. Uh, as we mature and get better at pitching to the CFO, we, do, we kind of move to stage two, which is we say to, we say to David, look, if you give me an extra million dollars in budget, I will return $2 million in retention rate improvements. Okay, now suddenly CS isn't just a cost, it's actually a revenue driving function, and I'm going to make a commitment to drive revenue with, the, with my team. So, okay, that's now this is more interesting. The most interesting thing, the most interesting approach is the last phase, phase which I think is the most mature phase, which is to say, okay, look, if we're able to improve retention rate by two points, what does that do for the overall value of the company? Because we know investors highly value retention rate improvements. So in fact, I think Bessemer five years ago said yep, yep. one point, one point retention improvement is, you know, two and a half uh, like, X, to, I think. To, to, two and a half X is like, yeah, yeah. on yeah. average, it's a $5 million improvement in valuation. So, um, so the, the, the most mature way to make the pitch to the CFO is look, give me a million dollars and I will return to the company $15 million worth in valuation improvements. Because the dollars, honestly, when it comes to retention rate, the dollars matter less than the rate. The rate matters a lot to Wall Street. The rate matters a lot to VC and to private equity. And so if we're really speaking the language of the CFO, we're, we're speaking the things that the CFO and the CEO are optimizing for, which is how do you maximize the value of the, com the company if you're a public company, it's the market cap. And if you're a private company, it's the valuation to drive fundraises. So you're, you're, you're asking for the same thing. You're asking for the same amount. You're just framing it in a way that's going to really be receptive by the CFO, by the board, by, right. by the C-suite. Yeah. It's, it's what I, as a CEO, it's what I care about. If the head of CS came and said, look, we are retention, you know, our gross retention rates at 88% and I'm going to get us to 91% in two years. Great. What a budget do you need? I'll give you whatever you want if you can get it to 91%. Yeah, I agree. It's it's ball game, right? In terms of getting the resources you need, if you can tie the net retention and then tie net retention to valuation, that's the ball game. And I think your CFO is probably already there yet, although maybe the, the kind of cause and effect isn't quite linear enough for the, the CFO. 
I think educating your CEO, educating the rest of the executive staff, educating the board on all that and getting everyone just nodding their head mm -hmm. on that one as soon as possible, right? Because I think uh, companies often realize it's just a bit too late. Like when that actual number is actually already massively impacting their valuation, they have enough business, then they realize it. And, you know, the reality is investment and customer success has, has to happen years in advance. Right? You guys have beforehand, right? right? You get that That's oh right. shit moment and you're That's like right. way too far down the hole, yeah. down yeah. the rabbit hole. You're like, oh, geez. <laughs> uh, so, um, by the way, we are taking questions from uh, LinkedIn Live. Uh, we got a question from LinkedIn. Arslan asks, company culture will also matter. Some companies are just very restrictive. What other ways would you do when the data metrics are, for example, difficult to get? Well, I, th I think, um, and this kind of gets back to uh, the point that, you know, there's a range of uh, information flow from company to company, um, especially in smaller uh, merging companies where, uh, you know, the information uh, flow is um, pretty tightly controlled. Uh, we, we, whether... we, we lived that, didn't we, David? Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. Yeah. Um, and so I think in situations where there is um, less information movement within an organization, that you fall back on your team and uh, make the effort to, you know, ask the questions that you think may be relevant to um, you doing better on the job. By you, I'm just referring to, you know, any individual CS rep, because you can only work with the information you have. And if information is available to you and you're choosing not to be intellectually curious, that's one thing. If the information is not available to you, you know, uh, in a rational organization, you're not going to be, uh, there's not going to be punitive effect um, to you not knowing that uh, particular piece of information. And then you fall back on the things that you do know um, and what you can control and, and what you can ask that would be relevant to uh, performing well in, in the CS role. I would say that, you know, look, you've got the metrics that you know, as you mentioned, then putting together a roadmap for the stuff that you don't know, right? It may be a two-year roadmap to get that data and put the systems in place and all that stuff, but that roadmap is is key. So you just know, hey, look, we're making an assumption on CAC. We don't know actually what our CAC is right now, but in three months we will because we're going to implement this to measure the marketing by category, then this and this and this. Like, that's Roadmap is just like any other product roadmap, except for it's with your finance team and maybe with your, your BI team. Well, I mean, you know, what you could just do is start asking questions um, about it, trying to get more information. And either the executive team will react to that by saying, great, here's a star up and comer who we want to promote and give more access to information. Or they'll say, let's fire this person because they're asking too many questions, in which case it's a wonderful opportunity to move to a better business that's a better fit for you. That's a great way. It's a great way to look at it. Uh, uh, Roxanne asks, "Can you clarify when you say CS should own a number?" I, I knew that that would pop. Some question would pop up about this. Do you recommend that that should be straight renewal, and or does that include a quota which can impact cross sells, upsells, which account management owns today? I think Mike should take that one. This is the <laughs> question of the hour, and. I will give a, a little bit of a cop-out answer. It really, really depends on your business. It depends on your team, what they're capable of, what they need to specialize in. For example, you can have a highly technical customer success team, right? Because that's what's required for your product. You can have a more sales and relationship-oriented team. That's really a big question mark uh, that you need to answer pretty quickly is, what is your team capable of? What are they best at, right? Because if you're hiring a team that is best at actually achieving that number, owning renewals, owning renewals and upsells, yeah, game on. Let's do that. Like, uh, if, if you can do that, fantastic, right? Fantastic for sales, fantastic for customer success and the whole company. So, but you just got to be real, very realistic about that. When we talk about owning revenue, 
is a little bit different than owning renewals and upsells. They're related, they're all tied together, but revenue is a little bit more focused on the existing customer base and what you need to do to capitalize on the revenue of that customer base. Yeah, but, but owning a number, see, I, I look at it as owning a number um, is 100%. Once the customer's in the door, it's 100% customer success's responsibility. It's your job. That's the job of customer. It's in the name, customer success. Our job is to create an environment where the renewal or the upsell or the expansion occurs, right? There's there's this, yeah, there, there, we, we want to also maintain that trusted advisor relationship so we're not selling to our customer, right? So we're, we're they're, they're, they believe that, hey, are you selling to me or are you, are you doing something that's in my best interest? Right? You have to maintain that best interest. But, you know, I, I am 100% converted on this. CS <laughs> needs to own the number. There needs to yeah. be a part of that that they're responsible for. And I don't think it's a huge leap to also expect if CS is doing the things that they need to be doing to create an environment for a successful customer, that they should own some amount of expansion revenue as part of that, because that is natural. It, it shouldn't be onerous. It shouldn't be some like, oh, yes, yeah, 50% expansion. But I don't think it's unreasonable to ask or expect a customer success team to create a situation where the customer not only renews, but they but but there's an expansion opportunity and to look for those things. I think the only thing that I would add to that is I've seen great examples of success teams where their charter is help the customer maximize the value of the thing that they bought. So that would be the renewal number and the upsell number, frankly, for a lot of companies. Yep. When it comes to cross-sell, cross-sell means another department, another buying unit within the organization. That's not helped me get more value. It's, it's, it's actually helped me close a new, let me get a new team or a new contract set up. So in some companies, the, that second part is actually better handled by sales because just the sales mentality is about new relationships, transaction, uh, grow. They're, they're just motivated by that where CSMs sometimes are not as motivated by that second piece, which is uh, new, you know, help find a new relationship, help find a new contract. So uh, to me, it seems natural for most teams to successfully execute on help me get the most value possible out of the thing I already bought. Yeah. Well, and it's who, who are you competing with, right? Is it, mm -hmm. do they have their hunters in there you know, there's their sales team in there pitching versus your CS team. That's that's not usually a recipe for success. Right. Well, and if once if CS is doing their job, the renewal should be a non-event and, and there should be some. And, and yeah, we're going to have sales maybe negotiating some of the terms or somebody in the back office negotiating some of the terms. If if customer success identifies you know, based off of demonstrating that value that, that, that the, the customers achieved identifies potential uh, opportunities outside of that group or with a different piece of software, and they've been able to recognize and paint a narrative around that, then it's a partnership with uh, sales or an account management person to actually go through the the uh, um, uh, the process of closing that that opportunity. But I still look at, you know, n none of that is going to be possible if customer success doesn't do what they're chartered to do, right? It's, it's almost like that, that, the, the, the terms and conditions is it's just a, uh, you know, it's just a, a necessary evil of the, and not evil, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just a necessary part of the process. Mm -hmm. And I like what Alejandro actually just chimed in saying, owning doesn't mean execution, right? So CS teams, I believe, should own the net retention number, right? Which is renewals and expansions, right? Does that mean they should be signing the contract, negotiating the deal? Like, not necessarily. Right. So the it depends and the, mm -hmm. the model in which your organization operates and the complexity of your product and the complexity and the, the maturity of your customers and all those things, back to your original uh, um, kind of cop-out answer, Mike, is <laughs> that, it, <laughs> that, it, that it does depend, right? Mm -hmm. It does depend. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see, Jordan at, is asking, um, and by the way, for those of you that are just joining us for the first time, we go 15 minutes past the hour. So if you want to stick around, have more questions, we'll go as long as we need to. 
Uh, Jordan asks, should CSM is responsible for assessing the cost and forecasting ROI for customer feature requests? Does the CFO get directly involved with assessing feature requests as well? Um, yeah, I want to jump in on this. CS is not maybe not maybe not CSMs, but CS leaders are 100% responsible for advocating for customers to the product management team. The CFO doesn't need to be involved in those conversations. This is really a CS and product management discussion. CS is accountable for quantifying the impact of different requests. So it's the number of customers that have made a request, the revenue impact of that request. Product can deal with the cost, right? Because they have direct access to engineering. They can cost out each feature or, or bug uh, request. But CS must take ownership for advocating for customers in requests that will, that will maximize re the retention rate needle. Okay, now that doesn't, though, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't. Now, in the case that I mentioned earlier with David, uh, that we, we had to deal with, I had a situation where we had uh, a deficiency in the product and uh, the, the services team uh, had to spend a lot of, of cycles um, and, and, and we had a lost opportunity cost uh, of, of services folks doing free work. Mm -hmm. uh, for customers because of deficiency in product. And I came to, I couldn't get engineering to commit to fixing it. So I did, I did the end around, went to David to enlist his help and said, Hey, look, look at what our, our team is spending on this and taking away from our customers that actually are good fits that don't need this, this functionality. And, and this is the estimate, which I had padded uh, from engineering to fix it. Right. So I actually was able to leverage you know, looking at the numbers, I was able to leverage uh, David in saying to our head of engineering, why aren't we fixing this? This is how much it's costing us, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't mean that you, 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 you can't or you shouldn't. I mean, that very much was a, I mean, that was an outlier, but that's kind of, that's one of the benefits that you get of having that type of relationship mm -hmm. with your CFO of being mm -hmm. able to sit there and, and talk in their language and translate. This is how much it's costing us, man. This is why, and I'm, 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 I'm elevating it to you because I'm getting no traction on the engineering side of the house. Yeah, just to be careful of that because you can burn bridges with product if they feel like you're going around them. <laughs> but yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. This thing was a train wreck into a dumpster fire to begin with. So <laughs> there was a lot of burning going on. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Okay, cool. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, uh, another uh, another LinkedIn question uh, from Arslan. Do you literally sit and calculate the number? Any recommended software tools you use to come to a number? Um, not really sure which, which number you're talking about, Arslan. Um, I think net retention, is it? Sit and calculate the number. Oh, the number. Maybe it's the number that CS owns. Yeah. And that's typically, uh, you know, something that's usually comes from 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 finance, right? My 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 recommended tool is going to finance, saying, "Well, what yeah. are you expecting?" Right, you get your top down and your bottoms up, right? So finance has got their tool set that they use to to calculate that, and then we use like something like Clary from a forecasting standpoint to to try and do a bottoms up. And you should be, and by the way, if you're CS leader, you should not only understand some of the basics of, of forecasting numbers, but you should also understand bottoms up and top down forecasts for your, for your team as well, right? You should understand things like, okay, well, how many people do I need for every million dollars or every X number of, of, of resources, uh, X number of customers, uh, potentially even broken down by segment. Uh, and be able to do I think a bottoms really up forecast, a top thing. down forecast. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Particularly early on when you're just taking over, right? Understanding the bottoms up. How many hours does it take to do this? What is the CSM doing every minute or every hour of the day on average? How much time are they spending doing things like spreadsheets for reporting and things like that? Building that bottoms up and then also doing that top down analysis to say, what percentage are we willing to? To spend on on CS as a percentage of revenue. What what was that translate to in terms of, of headcount? That's critical. And part of that, and once again, to your point, is understanding what your team is doing, 
what they're spending their time on, what they're working on. We actually uh, talk about that in our, uh, our level two, our level two courseware. We, we have something around uh, maximizing your, that, you know, identifying what time you're spending uh, servicing your clients and, and trying to maximize that time. Uh, and, and all of that is something that every CSM should be doing. Aggregate that together, figure out, okay, what's the, what's the average here? Uh, and then using that to, 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 to do your forecasting, your hiring forecast. Um, uh, let's see, Pam asks, and it looks like David wants to jump in on this. Uh, Pam asks, are CS teams responsible for writing the contracts or just setting up the idea that the expansion or renewal needs to happen? You're muted, David. Um, there you yeah, go. so I actually also wanted to, um, uh, Pam made a great point in chat that I wanted to acknowledge, um, for those of you who don't have it up, she said, companies need to demystify sales for their entire company. If we're with a company that has a good product, we should all be excited to help our customers get the most from it. Sales training uh, for everyone who is customer facing. And I think that's um, that's a very relevant point here that you know every communication between a CS rep and the customer is a form of sales. Um, and so... Uh, the more the the better the product is, the more that those conversations um, can exploit that uh, advantage. And it's not just, hey, is everything going okay? And only kind of, you know, troubleshooting when there's a problem, but more uh, proactive uh, conversation. And that kind of spills into uh, the question posed about um, CS teams responsible for writing the contracts. I I think, you know, there are some differing views on this, but um, my view uh, is no, that that's not a CS function. Uh, I think just setting up the idea that the expansion needs to happen, absolutely, because as a CS rep, you are there hearing the what the customer is saying about the product and also hearing that there might be other departments within an organization that could be interested in it. But then I think in order to sort of protect the CS rep from uh, uh, not being thrown into a procurement negotiation or something that could get complicated and, uh, uh, you know, turn it over to the bad cops, if you will, uh, in, whether it's the sales organization that's responsible for renewals or, you know, someone in finance, um, uh, different organizations are structured that way. But I don't think the contract writing should be the burden of the CST. Yeah, the best practice I've seen is just setting up a deal desk function. Sometimes that lives in sales, but <clears throat> they're responsible for drafting the contracts, getting approval and sign off from key stakeholders like finance, um, you know, key CS leaders, maybe people in sales, just make sure that the contract is written well, the gross pro profit margins meet the accepted thresholds, we've packaged the product the correct way, Etc. Yeah, you know, um, uh, Rav uh, Dollywall and I did a uh, uh, a uh, moment of truth uh, webcast. We recorded. It's gonna. It looks like it's gonna come out sometime late September, early October about uh, avoiding the customer success team becoming the everything department, uh, which is what was in your you know same thing you published mm -hmm. in this book. And 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 one of the things we talked about was that. Uh, and, and, and I think um, uh, Shari uh, points it out in the chat is that I don't think many CSMs realize they are selling. And it's true. We, 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 we're, we're trying to take a more um, traditional approach to on-prem sales uh, and fit it into this new subscription world that we're in. And it's not, uh, it's not a sales cycle. It's not an individual transactional sales cycle. It's become a continuous sales cycle. Right. And that continuous sales cycle is, you know, customer success is an integral part of that. They're a core part of that because their job, your job in customer success is to ensure that the customer is constantly getting a getting value out of that solution. That they're getting a dollar five, a dollar ten, a dollar fifteen of value out of every dollar that they're spending. That's your job. That's a continuous sales motion. Right. So and that continuous sales leads to renewals. Why would you go anywhere else? That continuous sales motion leads to uh, an expansion or, you know, Hey, we're making your, we're making your world better. We're making your people more effective. You're growing as an organization. I'm going to get an expansion or, Hey, I'm going to, 
I'm going to expand into another division because I've proven the value that you've gotten with this division. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very natural progression into this other division, right? We've proven the value. It's not a, I'm going to make a promise and then let's see what the reality is, which is uh, the traditional sales, you know, the beginning, the traditional uh, sales process. It's, I've demonstrated that value to you. Now, where do we take it from here? Uh, Pam, thanks for that question. Angela asks, what is this? What if the CS department is new to an organization with a single CSM, but multiple SaaS platforms already deployed to them? to the market with no onboarding or retention resources in place. Now you're pulling together your strategy for headcount and investment ask. To justify the investment ask, do you start with the current state of the churn of churn retention rate or try to also tie in an estimate in ROI? And Mike is jumping right into this. Mm -hmm. I like this one because I, I feel for you, Angela. You're in a really tough situation, but you know what? It's a huge opportunity. Oh, she's asking for someone else. Oh, you are. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that is a tough situation. So absolutely, you need to get your benchmark, your foundational data together. That's the first thing. The second thing, customer voice, right? Your voice of the customer. Get your customers talking, either via a survey, an interview, whatever you can do to actually capture good customer quotes on the importance of customer success, that kind of visceral, emotional tie in. And then what I would say is bring in the third party experts. And that doesn't mean you need to bring in consultants or anything like that. There's a McKinsey report out there that's really good that benchmarks what a customer success investment should look like, what high performing companies invest in customer success, what average companies invest in customer success. That's a great way. Uh, you can bring in like folks like Andrew, folks like uh, folks from Gainsight and others uh, can, to come in and talk to your exact team about that. They've got all that data right in front of them, but that third party, like it, it's, it'll be clear as day when, when they come in. You know, for, for me, Angela, on this question, the first, if I was in your shoes, the first question I would ask is why after all this time did someone hire a CSM? <laughs> because someone somewhere decided, Hey, what if we create a CSM team? And so uh, what you want to understand is what was the pain in the organization that led to this decision? What executive supported it? And then as best as if I was in your shoes, I would try to align my first six months or year effort to create some wins for the org for the problem that was intended to be solved. Because building up a couple of really quick wins for yourself and the CS team will unlock tons of opportunities to do a lot of the things that Mike talked about. So it'll, it will allow you to uh, grow the presence of the CSM team, get access to more resources. Um, but if you come in with your own agenda without addressing the asks of the team that brought you on in the first place, you might be shooting yourself in the foot. Awesome. Hey, David, can you hit done on your question? Mike, can you hit done on your questions? Alejandro asked, Mike, you need to share the link to that McKinsey report. It looks like you dropped mm -hmm. that in the chat. Thank you, Mike. Notice how handy I have it, just in case. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I clearly, I've used it a few times. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Nice. Awesome. Uh, any other, I don't see any other questions. Any, any last, last thoughts, guys, before we, uh, before we wrap things up for the day? I have one last thought, actually. It's not only with your own finance department and your own CFO. Think about the customer's finance department and their CFO, actually. Mm -hmm. So understanding that language, you can learn a lot from your own CFO, but then interacting with the customers and understanding the business levers that they're pulling, really critical. Super important. Yeah. Chris, you got something you want to throw in there? Really? We, we, we've extracted um, everything we can from you today? Yeah. Um... Come on, you always uh, have something to say. I, I, I will have something. Let's let's go to David first. All right, let's I'll go to out, David. I'll come first. out with a zinger. I'll come with a zinger. Okay. <laughs> David, any any parting words? Um, you know, I think this has been a great discussion, and I think the uh, audience engagement, um, the type of questions uh, that were framed, I think was really good because this is. Um, uh, th there's a wide range of ways to tackle uh, a lot of these questions. The metrics themselves are kind of black and white uh, once you have the data. 
Um, but scope of responsibility and what you do with them, um, those uh, business decisions and day-to-day -day operating decisions are much more nuanced. And so, um, you know, I think that's one of the takeaways of today and, uh, you know, hopefully can uh, provide insight uh, for folks um, as they go back to uh, their day jobs. Awesome. And Chris, we got to okay. uh, ask about the book. So you want to you want to close things out and also mention. Sure. I, I'll be your uh, fan of white here. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll drop a note here. Actually, we can send it as a part of the, the recording. We'll send a link if you want a copy of a physical copy of the book. I think probably the closing thought is uh, the the 2.0 CS leader. So the, the CS leader of the future is not does not focus all their time on running a better customer success department. The, the CS leader of the future uh, thinks about how to arm the company with the right customer data to drive retention rate improvements across the whole business. And I think that's actually how a CS leader gets better presence in front of the CFO, more leverage with product, better influence over the CRO. And so uh, obviously there's a lot more that we could talk about on that topic, but yeah, the, the, the 2.0 leader of the future focuses on using customer data to drive a better business. Awesome. All right. We're at the end of our webinar. I think it went well, but it's not what I think. It's what all of you think. So please let us know by posting your feedback on LinkedIn and tagging us. I want to thank my amazing panel of guests for spending the time with us today, as well as our prep call uh, earlier this week. Uh, we very much appreciate you making the time in your schedule to provide the insights and best practices that you shared. Uh, one final note, uh, great CS leaders um, know they don't have all the answers, but they know where to get them. That's why we created the CS Leadership Roundtable to harness the knowledge and experience of the community to help improve everyone. So we hope you got something out of this, uh, out, out of the time you spent with us. And we'll see you at your next session on uh, September 15th, where we're going to be talking about emotional intelligence for customer success. Check out successcoaching.co to find out more and sign up until we see you again. Have a great rest of your day, week, and month. Stay safe and stay healthy, everyone.